Good morning, everyone. Um, this is quite a virtuous uh, breakfast set here. Uh, people who get up at uh, 8 in the morning to come hear depressing things about climate change. So thank you. Um, I have with me today, uh, I'm going to start with uh, Max Holmes down here at the end, who is the deputy director uh, of the Woods Hole Research Center, um, which is a very fancy way of saying that he's an Arctic scientist. Um, and then I have Jacqueline Gill, who is a professor at the University of Maine of paleoecology, which means she thinks about what the world was like um, tens of thousands, if not millions of years ago, uh, before we were here. Um, and we're here to talk about uh, how woolly mammoths can help fight climate change, um, which is quite an eccentric topic. I know, having spent uh, almost a year, really, uh, Max and Jacqueline both know that because I would call them incessantly during this year, um, thinking and researching this subject about literally how woolly mammoths can fight climate change. Um, and we're going to try to, because that sounds so crazy, sort of connect the dots as to why that's true here this morning. But um, before we do that, I wanted to, the title of this session is Climate Moonshots. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why we even think that we, should, we need a moonshot. Um, usually when people do think, when people talk about moonshots, like, ah, we need to, you know, get to the moon before the Russians do, or we need to do something like the Manhattan Project, it's because they feel that we are facing serious peril. And so I wanted to kind of um, start there and think about uh, if this is even necessary. And Max, I, I figured I'd start with you uh, because you study the Arctic. Um, Tell me a little bit, like you hear, you see headlines constantly that, you know, that the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere on the earth and that, you know, um, the sea ice is shrinking every year. How drastic is the situation? Well, as you said, the, the warming in the Arctic is two to three times greater than the global average. And the Arctic's also particularly sensitive to warming. So much of it sort of balances on the freezing point of water. So once you cross that threshold, all kinds of changes take place. So uh, you mentioned the loss of sea ice, you have thawing of permafrost, you have uh, changes in river discharge, changes in vegetation, changes in the, the distribution of uh, animals as well. So all kinds, uh, all, all different parts of the Arctic system are already changing rapidly. And it looks like that probably the pace of change, unfortunately, will accelerate as we move forward. Is there, I mean, uh, sometimes uh, climate change is, is such a doom and gloom topic here. Uh, going up to uh, Chersky in, in northeastern Siberia to report this story, and I know you've been there uh, before as well, uh, I have to say a lot of the people in Siberia I met were quite excited about climate change. Um, they were, uh, uh, you know, they, it's, it's very cold there in the winter, as you know. Um, I've heard even people, even Europeans say, well, you know, you might have vineyards on Greenland. Uh, why should we think about this as a bad thing? Well, yeah, occasionally you run across people that um, think, yeah, a little bit of warming might be a nice thing. And you can yeah. kind of understand that if you're from one of the coldest places on Earth. Mm -hmm. But even those people that live in the Arctic, their lives are being dramatically impacted, and, and that will certainly continue. Um, they rely, the transportation relies upon frozen surfaces. So uh, many of the places I work in, both the Siberian Arctic and in Alaska and Canada, the way they get around in the winter is either moving up and down frozen rivers or just crossing the land and not worrying about where, where, where there's a lake or something because you can cross anything because it's frozen. And now as the Arctic's getting warmer and, uh, and ice, the patterns of ice and the seasonality of ice is changing, it's making it really hard to get around. And as permafrost thaws, the infrastructure collapses. So yeah, I, um, um, while a few degrees of warming might seem nice when it's minus 40 degrees Celsius out, um, <laughs> the, the negatives, I think, far outweigh that small positive. What about globally? So I, I mean, of course, we may not like entertain doing moonshot caliber things if it were only to keep the rivers frozen <clears throat> in Siberia. Yeah. But like, what are the, the larger sort of uh, effects that we're trying to avert here? So I, I spent a lot of my time working on permafrost in the Arctic. So that's permanently frozen ground, or we say permanently frozen. It technically is defined as ground that's been frozen for two or more years consecutively in practice. Much of it's, most of it's been uh, 
frozen for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and it's starting to thaw now. But uh, let me give you a few numbers. As a scientist, I'll throw a few numbers out um, to put the permafrost issue in perspective. So in the atmosphere right now, there are about 850 billion tons of carbon. 850 billion tons. That's a really hard number to wrap your head around, but I'll give some other numbers for comparison. And I'll also say that's about a 43% increase in carbon in the atmosphere since the start of the pre-industrial. So human activities have put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, all the vegetation on Earth, so it's mainly forests where the carbon is, but all the vegetation on Earth has around 500 billion tons. So 850 billion tons in the atmosphere, 500 in forests or in vegetation. Um, in fossil fuels left in the ground that we could pull out should we decide to go that route, so talking about coal, uh, oil, and natural gas, there are around 1,200 billion tons. So 850 in the atmosphere, 500 vegetation, 1,200 fossil fuels. And permafrost is thing that we uh, don't think too much about when we're thinking about climate change usually. There are about 1,500 billion tons. So three times more than all the vegetation on Earth. There's twice as much as in the atmosphere, roughly. It's built up over the last many thousands of years. The, the permafrost of the Arctic has slowly accumulated carbon. And now as we're turning up the temperature, essentially we're turning a freezer into a refrigerator, and we're starting to lose some of that carbon. And that can make it really difficult to control climate change. So that, that's, that's why I think a lot about the Arctic, and I think that's why people all around the world, that's one, certainly one of the main reasons why people all around the world should be thinking a lot about the Arctic. That was a lot of math uh, for breakfast. It's so four uh, numbers, four, uh, yeah. we can do it, four numbers. <laughs> I could tell it's very scary. Um, Jacqueline, I want to go to you. So I, as I said earlier, um, you know, you're someone who thinks about what kinds of species were on the Earth at different periods of time. Um, I, you'll forgive me if I'm wrong about this, but my intuition is that you study the Ice Age um, in particular. But even zooming out from the Ice Age, like give us kind of the big picture. How radically is the Earth? I mean, a, a lot of people say, just like our friends in Siberia who say, oh, it's getting warmer, great. Um, a lot of people say, look, uh, uh, the Earth is, the climate of the Earth has changed and fluctuated through its entire history in very dramatic ways, and look, we're all here. Um, and uh, ecosystems have evolved, uh, species have evolved. What's the big deal? How, how radical is what's happening right now? So I think you might wonder, you know, what, what is a paleoecologist doing up here? You know, from my perspective, all the climate change that I study has already <laughs> happened. It's, you know, long ago, much of it before human civilization actually began, um, before the invention of agriculture even. Um, but I think what's, what's really important is that by studying the past, we can contextualize the present. So we do know that there are natural cycles of uh, ice ages in the last two and a half million years. There have been over a dozen of these sort of warm periods like the one we're in now, and then the ice ages like the one that just you know, ended roughly 12,000 years ago. Um, and what, by studying that, we can not only understand what the natural variation in the climate system is, which allows us to contextualize not only how fast the, the rate of warming is today, but also how much. And so, you know, when we talk about, you know, one to four degrees Celsius, I like to think of that, um, there's a really great XKCD cartoon um, that, that draws this out as one ice age unit. Yeah. And so the idea of, you know, you hear these numbers, you know, one to four degrees Celsius, that's not a lot, but it's a difference between, you know, an ice age period just, you know, 21,000 years ago where we would have had extensive ice all over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, where I live now in Maine would have been under, you know, a couple kilometers thick of ice, and today, right? And so there's a huge amount of climate change um, that, you know, is, is at least recognized by the Earth. Like, the Earth notices, you know, one to four degrees Celsius. Sure. So when we think about warming that's coming in the, in the next century and what the past can do to contextualize that, we usually think about how much warming is coming. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly we're on at least the order of magnitude of warming that uh, we've seen in recent ice age cycles but also how fast that warming is. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that's important to keep in mind is that we, you know, there have been times in the past where the climate has warmed as quickly as we're expecting to see in the next century. For example, when we, when we came out of the last ice age, there were these, period, these abrupt uh, climate shifts. Um, we don't quite fully understand the mechanisms behind those, but they involve a lot of, um, you know, feedbacks uh, in the glaciers and the oceans and the atmosphere all of which are important information for us to sort of, okay, where can we see these tipping points, these abrupt events coming in the next century? 
Um, and so those can be really good analogs for the next century of warming. Mm -hmm. But it's important to remember that we started at ice age conditions before we rapidly warmed the Earth a few degrees. Right. Now we're starting at an interglacial <laughs> warm period condition. And there's some evidence to suggest that what we're expecting in the next century might be well out of the natural climate variability of the last you know, 500,000 years, 2 wow. million years, depending on how, how, how much we're committed down this path. Um, I, sometimes I've, uh, you hear uh, people who study mass extinctions in particular point out that some of the very worst mass extinctions, including the end Permian event, which was, I think, 252 million years ago thereabouts, when something like 70% of all uh, terrestrial life, uh, land life, and then 95% of ocean life was wiped out in a very short time. And that was due to carbon emissions, uh, specifically uh, uh, these huge super volcanoes at the top of the Pangaea in Siberia, actually, um, coming up. And as they came up through the crust, burning all the fossil fuels from, like I think, Devonian forests that were there previously. Uh, is that, like, should we be worried about scenarios like that? I mean, not in the next hundred years, but if do we, is there even enough carbon in the ground to do something like that? I, I think when you, when you want to contextualize a modern mass extinction or a modern mm -hmm. extinction event in comparison to the past, I think it's important to think about mechanisms, mm -hmm. um, even though the exact uh, pathways may be a little bit different. Um, certainly, you know, we're emitting an awful lot of buried carbon into the atmosphere, um, arguably on the same rate that you know, a, a series of volcanoes, they may have taken tens of thousands of years in some cases, and we're doing it pretty quickly in comparison. Um, and I think it's also important to remember, you know, some of the same processes that have caused extinctions in the deep past mm -hmm. are, are relevant today, a big one being ocean acidification, right? right? A lot of that carbon actually ends up being absorbed by the oceans, and we're starting to see some of the effects of that now. Um, so some of our largest mass extinctions that we see in the fossil record were, were driven by ocean acidification. So you have to mm -hmm. think about, you know, it's not always the, the carbon per se or the warming per se. There are all these sort of col collateral damages that happen, and that's often what we see drives extinction. Things like sea level rise, large scale changes in um, atmospheric moisture patterns. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, you know, Death Valley 21,000 years ago would have been this verdant, uh, lush forest with a you know, rich, deep lake full of all kinds of species. Um, because the ice sheet had pushed the polar jet further south and bringing the sort of storm tracks into the southwest. So it was actually a very wet, wonderful place to be. Yeah. Um, and as the ice sheet melted and those storm tracks mo moved further north, um, now, you know, it's, it's a very different place today. So all of the species that would have been living in those lakes would have gone extinct, um, not necessarily because of warming, but because of large scale changes in the, the position of the jet stream. And yeah. that's certainly something, you know, we're starting to hear about more now. Um, as especially in the linkages between the jet stream and Arctic warming. And are there good uh, models for how, suppose we did see four, five, six uh, degrees Celsius jump over the, <laughs> Max is shaking his head. Max is, I've just, uh, we've touched on his nightmare. Um, uh, yeah, could, I mean, uh, is Earth resilient enough to handle that? Or are we talking about every ecosystem on Earth just unwinding? Well, Earth is going to be here yeah. Yeah, for a sure. long time. Um, what I worry more about are the 7.3 billion people that are on the Earth right now, or maybe mm -hmm. the 8 or 9 or 10 billion that will be here uh, 100 years from now. And while the climate change is naturally independent of, independent of any human activities, we haven't had big climate shifts since there have been a bunch of people on the face of the Earth. So if we go back 10,000 years ago, for the last 10,000 years, the Earth's climate has been relatively stable. It's probably not coincidental that that's when the human population has increased from sure. maybe around 2 million people 10,000 years ago to 7.3 now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, uh, the really big warming like you just mentioned of 4 or 5 or 6 degrees Celsius, much more than that in the Arctic, is a really tough thing to handle when you have that many people on Earth mm -hmm. and na national boundaries mm -hmm. yeah. that somehow impede the movement of folks that around the world. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, from the perspective of species, you know, there, there were biodiverse functional ecosystems in the past when it was, you know, five or six degrees Celsius warmer mm -hmm. um, than today. But one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, as I mentioned, this, this series of ice ages that really took off around two and a half million years ago is just the tail end of a cooling trend 
that's mm -hmm. been going on for about 30 million years. And so, you know, we've had permanent ice at the poles on and off for roughly about 30 million years. And so that's sort of what we call ice house earth, right? Mm -hmm. Versus a greenhouse earth, which is what we're sort of moving towards. Um, and we've slowly been changing the, the, the actors, if you will, the species on the, on the earth stage in response to that, that cooling, that progressive cooling. And so, you know, there have been a series of, of extinctions that have been driven, you know, as we've moved more and more into ice house earth conditions. And so all the species we would have loved to have had around to deal with, you know, where we're going in the next century have been successively filtered out mm. over, you know, 30 million years of cooling and in some cases drying. And so, um, yeah, there are places on the earth where there will be climate change winners, yeah. uh, but there will be a lot of climate change losers. And the <laughs> other thing to remember, too, is that um, unlike the past, we have a highly fragmented... Hmm. Um, landscape. We have, you know... Say more about that. What do you mean? Oh, so we have, you know, lots of, um, you know, farms and, pa mm -hmm. you know, paved spaces and cities and roads and all of these barriers to dispersal, which even in the fossil records, I work a lot on extinction and the causes of mm -hmm. extinction related to climate change. It's often not so much the warming per se that kills you. It's, you know, if, if species can track their climate, if they can sort of move into the areas and follow where their optimal habitat is, then they're probably going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, but if they can't do that, and that might be because of natural barriers um, like the Mediterranean Sea, or it might be because of something like a mountain, nowadays it's gonna be, you know, uh, farmlands and mm -hmm. urban areas, um, then, then they're gonna be the losers of climate change. And so climate change is really forcing us, I think, to be really creative in terms of our conservation strategies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, regardless of how much warming we're committed to, we're going to, I think, have to be a little bit more creative and a little bit more hands-on in terms of managing species to help usher them through um, the next century. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we've learned what we already knew, uh, which is climate change is a, a very dangerous thing. Um, I want to show a very short uh, film clip uh, from this place, Pleistocene Park in Siberia, where they are trying to bring back the woolly, the woolly mammoth uh, in order to terraform uh, Siberia into uh, a grassland, into an ice age grassland, actually, uh, for the purposes of, of f keeping the permafrost frozen so that all that scary carbon that Max was talking about does not float up in the air. Um, take a look. Если бы ты стоял на этом берегу 20 или 30 тысяч лет назад, ты бы видел 100 мамонтов, тысячу бизонов, тысячу лошадей, 3000 разных оленей, 30 носорогов, 40 овцебыков, 30 тигра-львов, несколько сотен волков и иногда человек, очень редко. In sunny day, climb up the hill where you would see like good distance around you. You would see, on average, like about 3,000 big herbivores. Today you would see nothing. When humans appear, all mammoths disappear, and soon all grassland disappear. Finally, most of species disappear totally from this territory. explain something which people never saw. I need only to establish example for show and any person who visit feel good. It's like park. Of the Arctic Circle, we are slowly working on preparing pastures which will be suitable for mammoths. Give me a hundred mammoths and give me enough money to feed them. You will not recognize this place next time you're here.
feel obligated to tell a story. Uh, that this uh, footage was graciously uh, we're allowed to screen that uh, by the filmmaker Grant Slater, who accompanied me on this reporting trip uh, to Pleistocene Park in Siberia, and um, he is a, a wonderfully talented filmmaker. In fact, I I called him and uh, asked him to go with me because he had he had adapted something I'd written maybe four or five years ago. And I knew that he'd spoken Russian. He lived in Moscow for four years, so it was kind of like a two for one, this like beautiful cinematographer and also like an interpreter fixer. Um, but when we got to Moscow, he lost, the airline lost one of his uh, suitcases with all his clothes in it. So he had to sort of scramble around the airport um, buying, uh, you know, airport shirts. So then we've got, you know, four flights later and like seven time zones later. Max, you've done this haul. It's really punishing. Um, we arrive in Chersky, which is this like tiny Arctic airport, and uh, Russian soldiers bo board our plane um, as they do, and they're you know they they want all your paperwork, and you have to have special permission even to go in this zone because the Arctic is uh, a very valuable place geopolitically. And uh, Grant had not submitted his paperwork in time, and Nikita, who you just saw talking there, the the younger gentleman there, uh, uh, said that you know oh it's okay we can get us out of this jam. But we had to go and, and really be interrogated at the military base there. And Grant, during this interrogation, which he did speak Russian for, it was really, I was sort of sitting off to the side and like watching the voice tones kind of like go up and down in a really tense way. Um, because he had done some reporting for the New York Times in the Ukraine, and so just, you know, he was sort of, uh, you know, edging into persona non grata. But anyway, he's wearing a fluorescent green shirt that says Russia is a great power <laughs> that, he, that he had picked up at the airport in Moscow. And I'm, I'm not sure if it helped or hurt his case, but uh, I, I had a very long section on that in the Atlantic Magazine article that I did on this, but I, it got cut, and so I feel obligated to tell that story here today. Um, but uh, let's start, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, this is this father-son group. They are, uh, as you saw, preparing pastors for the resurrected woolly mammoth. Um, Max, I'm going to go over to you. This is what's nice, uh, so that no longer me writing, so I can just you know ask the expert again. But um, why would anyone want to put grasslands in the Arctic? Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. I first okay. just say a sure. couple of words about Sergei Zimov and Nikita Zimov. So Sergei's the father, and I've known him, I don't know, for 15 years or a bit more. And he's definitely one of those guys that's somewhere at the intersection of madman and genius, you know, and it <laughs> depends on the day. You can't figure out which one of those characteristics yeah. uh, wins out that day, but he's just this absolutely remarkable guy. That depends has, on the vodka, too. Yeah, say. all <laughs> kinds of crazy ideas, a lot of which turn out to be right. Uh, one of them, I'll, I'll, I'll hmm. relay, is a year ago about, he stated in his typical way with absolutely no doubt that Trump would become our next president. Yeah. And that, you know, what are you, that's crazy? <laughs> no way. And so, I mean, that's just one example of, well, uh, he's actually right about that. Um, why would we want to put grasslands back hmm. where Earth's largest forest now exists? So I should say I'm at the, uh, as Ross said in the introduction, I'm a scientist at the Woods Hole Research Center. We focus on climate change. We work all around the world, our logo, I love our logo. It's a tree with the leaves of the tree or the continents of the world. So we think a lot about preserving forests, restoring forests where they've been chopped down. So when I suggest um, to our board, for example, that we might want to think about doing some things that could wipe out the largest forest on Earth, it raises some eyebrows. Um, why would we want to do that? Um, I already gave you some numbers, how much carbon is in the ground, in the Arctic, in the permafrost, the, certainly the, um, Russia has by far the largest share, Siberia, the boreal forest in Siberia is the biggest chunk of the Arctic. There's an incredible amount of carbon there. And if you think about how much carbon is in the vegetation and the trees in that forest, it's, I mean, it's, it's a huge forest, but the trees are pretty small and pretty sparse. So Arctic overall, there are about a couple more numbers. Again, 1,500 billion tons of carbon in the ground, maybe 25 billion tons in the vegetation. So you mm -hmm. could think about sacrificing some of that carbon that's in the trees if that would, in fact, help you keep the ground cold and the carbon in the ground. Mm -hmm. So how does it keep the ground how cold? How does it keep the ground cold? All right. Um, 
two ways, essentially. Um, one is uh, when you go from grassland to forest, or from forest to grassland, you, ch you change the reflectivity or the albedo mm -hmm. of the surface. So if you think of a grassland in Siberia in the spring or fall, the sun's shining. It's not shining in the winter, but in the spring and fall, it's shining. You basically have a white surface. It's snow covered. There's nothing sticking through the snow. So if sunlight comes in, the vast majority of it reflects right back out. It doesn't cause any warming. But if you have trees sticking through, those aren't covered with snow. They're much darker, and so much more of the incoming sunlight, incoming solar radiation is absorbed, which causes warming. So you get rid of the trees, you change the reflectivity, you mm. bounce more of the, the sunlight back out, and you don't cause warming. The other thing um, that you get if you have a whole bunch of big animals moving around maintaining this grassland, maintaining this pasture, is they trample down the snow. And it turns out snow is a great insulator. So if you have this much snow in the Arctic in the winter, the air temperature may be minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, the ground temperature might be minus 5 or minus 10. If you have a bunch of animals that pack down that snow, it greatly reduces the insulating capacity. So more of that cold air temperature can propagate into the ground, and it makes the ground colder. Mm -hmm. So basically two things. Uh, the reflectivity of the surface changes, and you reduce the insulating capacity of the snow by trampling it down. Hmm. Um, Jacqueline, tell us about the kind of animals that you need. So this now that um, I imagine that you spend some some portion of your day every day is kind of imagining what it was <laughs> like uh, in the ice age in an ice age grassland. Uh, what sort of animals do you need to maintain that biome? Yeah, so I, I do actually um, spend a, a probably way too much of my time during the day sort of thinking about the past, and I really appreciated um, uh, uh, Nikita, no, uh, Sergey's comment that mm. it's hard to communicate to people what they can't see. Mm. And so if you imagine sort of the, the poster child of a, of a diverse mega herbivore ecosystem would be a place like Africa today, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you could imagine that you know, North American um, megafaunal populations and also diversity, so that the type and number of large herbivores we would have had just, you know, here would have been greater than what we see in Africa today. And then in the case of, you know, when we get up into the Arctic, it would have been even greater. And so you had things like, you know, woolly mammoths and many species of mammoths actually, um, woolly rhinoceros, um, you know, bison, horses, um, all, you know, just a number of different animals. And what's important to remember is that those animals are doing lots of things. They're, they're, they're trampling the snow, they're brushing the snow away to get at the, the, the plants below so that they can eat in the wintertime. Um, they're pooping and moving nutrients around, they're moving seeds around, they're also eating plants. In fact, a lot of the research that we've done in my lab has suggested not only could these large herbivores uh, reduce the amount of carbon that we lose from these ecosystems, but they also in turn make the ecosystems more resilient to warming because they sort of mediate the, comp the sort of arms race between different plants and allow a, a greater diversity of plants to thrive in a grassland. And so when you have native herbivores, you actually have a more diverse grassland. And that greater diversity actually increases the resilience um, of the ecosystem to any kind of climate change. And so there's this incredible feedback system that, that starts to emerge. And um, you know, when we look at the fossil record, we see that this, the so-called mammoth steppe, um, this you know, widespread yeah. grassland that was populated not just by mammoths, but by all sorts of other large herbivores, um, was incredibly diverse, much more diverse than the grasslands that we see in the, in the tundra today. And what is it about the woolly mammoth? Uh, you said the mammoth steppe, that whole biome is named for the mammoth, mm -hmm. um, and it plays, as I understand it, a very important ecological role. And what is that role? Why are people anxious to actually bring back woolly mammoths to achieve this? Well, because they're cool. Um, <laughs> That's definitely uh, part of it. But also um, because they're... Um, so the, the woolly mammoth isn't just the charismatic megafauna of the Ice Age. It's, mm -hmm. you know, just like elephants today, we know that it's also, it would have been a keystone herbivore. So this idea of a, if you think of an, uh, an ecosystem like an arch, you know, mm -hmm. the, all the different blo stone blocks that build up that arch, um, they're held together by one single stone at the top that's the load-bearing stone. And so even though it's just one stone, it's, it's allowing the entire arch to stand. And if you pull that stone out, the arch falls apart. And we see that in um, 
a lot of grasslands today. You know, the bison are considered a keystone herbivore of the, the American plains, um, and the elephant is, is a keystone herbivore of you know, the Serengeti. And so we, we know that these large herbivores today, even, even in a world that is smaller functionally, like our, all of our animals are smaller, we have downsized planet Earth. Mm. So even in our downsized planet Earth, we know that those keystone herbivores are incredibly important, not only for maintaining that diverse habitat, but also for lots of other you know, medium-sized grazers and predators and other things. So there's a whole food web component in there, and, so, and, and woolly mammoths are at the top of that. They're the keystone. So even if they're not necessarily the most uh, abundant, they're certainly the most important in terms of what they do on the landscape. Hmm. Um, yeah, and you just said something interesting. I, I had never heard it phrased that way. We downsized Earth. Uh, and I, I, I know that you're referring to the extinction of large herbivores, which took place at the, at the end of the last ice age, uh, when Earth, we lost something like 95% of the large herbivores that were hanging around, like, you know, everywhere you went, whether it was um, Australia, South America, North America, there were giants and not just woolly mammoths, but all kinds of giant sloths and so forth. Um, and I know that over the past few decades, there's been a debate about uh, why this happened. Um, and there's been two schools. There's been the climate change school, uh, where um, uh, people think that because the ice age ended, th these large animals couldn't adapt. Uh, and so uh, they saw their way out. And then there is the overkill hypothesis, which uh, was first formulated, actually, it's been a while, like some 50, 60 years ago, um, which is the idea that humans, as they spread across the Earth at the end of the last ice age, which is precisely when they spread across the, the Earth, um, and they had been, evolution had trained them to be, uh, to live in a world of scarcity, and all of a sudden, they'd, they'd refine their hunting technology and their, uh, their ability to work in groups, uh, some, not unlike today's sports teams. Uh, and they just went on something of a rampage. Uh, or you know, they brought fire with them that radically changed the landscapes. Uh, the, the bottom line being that it was actually humans who killed all of these large herbivores. And I was surprised to find, when I was researching these, this piece, that uh, the pendulum uh, appears to be swinging towards people as the culprit. And uh, first of all, is that accurate? And second of all, why? It's interesting. It, it's gone back and forth um, mm -hmm. to this idea of the, uh, the, the so-called Blitzkrieg hypothesis by Paul Martin. And that word Blitzkrieg was used very deliberately at the, t at the time to really you know, evoke the sort of you know, German panzer, sort of you know, the tanks running across the landscape and just mm -hmm. mowing down everything in sight. And so this, it's a very provocative word. Um, and the idea being that as soon as humans arrive in a, in a continent, um, within a few centuries, they wipe out all of the megafauna. I think we've since revised that as we've improved you know, our ability to date bones. We found more sites that show that humans have lived alongside of megafauna, at least in North America, longer than we thought. Um, but the idea, I mean, the, the, there's, so there's been a, a kind of a nasty debate in the literature about whether humans or climate caused the extinction. And I think we're moving towards a, a synthesis that suggests um, that Climate change certainly affects populations of large herbivores. Mm -hmm. we, know, we know that to be true today, and I would never say that organisms don't react to climate change, um, but that, that those sort of natural population cycles that may have followed those climate shifts um, may, may have made those species more vulnerable to, to human activity. But if you look at the pattern of the extinction, it's really hard for me to explain how you get the extinction of these animals following the movement of humans across the continent, especially in places like Australia, where the where humans arrive, mm -hmm. you know, well before the climate changes, animals mm -hmm. go extinct. They sort of move into Eurasia, animals go extinct. Move into North and then South America, animals go extinct. Yeah. Um, and also just the fact that we've, like I, I mentioned earlier, we've had so many cycles of ice ages and, and warm periods. And it's only this last one where we lose these large animals. And the only really different thing about our warm period today is us. And so I, I think you, know, you, have to, you have to really, if, if you want to argue that climate change is the sole cause of the extinctions, you need to come up with a good mechanism. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the, the, like I said, the research we've done in our lab has shown that widespread vegetation change seems to be a consequence of the extinction. And yeah. so when you remove these keystone herbivores, the ecosystem kind of goes through a period of upheaval. Um, and so, that's been a big focus of our research. And so if, if it's not their habitat loss and it's not necessarily the, you know, the warming temperatures, then you need another mechanism. And I haven't, I haven't been convinced by any of the other suggestions. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that really attracted me to this story was this notion that um, as this day, it, 
assuming that we were to get a much more detailed picture of how these extinctions unfolded and it became ever more clear that it was human activity that caused them, uh, that we would really take that on board in our sort of self-conception as a species and uh, might be still more motivated to do something about it. Now, most of what we do will just be about conserving the, the creatures that are lucky enough to still live among us uh, today. But then we're also hearing this idea of de-extinction, of bringing back, uh, for instance, the woolly mammoth being among the most charismatic uh, uh, examples of the kind of species. I mean, people want to bring back passenger pigeons, and I like passenger pigeons. I think they're cool, but I want to see a woolly mammoth. Um, and I, there are a number of ethical questions around this, and I wonder, like, Max, I mean, when, when you first heard this idea, did you think that's crazy? Um, these, for instance, you know, to take only one of many potential ethical issues with bringing back these animals, <clears throat> elephants are really social animals. Uh, and to bring back the first one, for instance, is probably gonna live a, a completely miserable life. The first 10 may live a, a completely miserable life. Maybe the first 1,000 will. But then eventually that species gets uh, back on board and all of a sudden the elephant has had its range re-extended from just you know, this tippy, tippy bottom of Africa all the way up to the Arctic. Is that worth doing? Are, the, is there, are those trade-offs worth it? Yeah, so when I, I guess when I first heard this idea, I, I did think it was crazy. And I still think it's kind of crazy, but I'm increasingly intrigued by it um, for the climate change reason, that's, that's one. But also, as you mentioned, the way I think about it or feel about it um, is influenced by what caused the extinction in mm -hmm. the first place. And if humans played a big role in it, and I accept that they did, mm -hmm. then, then it's easier to accept that we would take some action to bring those animals back. I mean, we would all fight, I think, to save the last one or two of whatever species may be threatened currently. And if the last one or two died and there was a way to bring them back the next day, I think most of us might say, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's, let's bring that, let's save that last elephant or something like that. And maybe the farther back you have to go, the harder <laughs> it is to think about. But um, I mean, there's one site that I think was shown in the film mm -hmm. where this big eroding cliff along the Coloma River in Siberia, I've been there, I don't know, 12 different years or something like that. And every time I've been there, you find mammoth bones and lots of mammoth bones. And it makes yeah. it a lot more real. And you recognize these are not fossils in this. I mean, these are the bones. And you, you find hair. And like, OK, these things lived not that long ago. And it really seems like we or our ancestors had something to do with wiping them out. Mm -hmm. It would be really cool to have them back. And it would be really good, potentially, for the Earth's climate, too. Uh, it's important to note also that <laughs> Um, a lot of the mega herbivores, the big animals that were around 12,000 years ago main, maintaining this vast grassland are still there. It's just the numbers are way down. So mm -hmm. it's moose, moose and musk ox, reindeer, mm -hmm. wild horses. All, they're all there. Um, so you can get a good part of the way um, to restoring and maintaining the, uh, the grassland um, without the woolly mammoth. But um, they'd sure be a nice addition. Yeah. Jacqueline, are you troubled? Well, so when I first started this, I w I, the idea I was very troubled because of the, the fact that we know that, these, these, that there's a lot of evidence from the fossil record that uh, woolly mammoths are matriarchal, that they have social structure just like modern elephants do, and so they would have had a, you know, a learned culture that was passed on from generation to generation. And so again, you know, is a cloned mammoth in a lab really a mammoth? Um, who's going to teach it to be a mammoth? What, you know, what's, what's that mammoth's culture? Um, but then, you know, I, I've increasingly been intrigued by the ecosystem function argument, right? That if mm -hmm. these mammoths can help stave off catastrophic climate change, if they can make a tundra more resilient to climate change, and th then suddenly, uh, for me, that changes the argument a little bit. And I think it's also really important to remember um, that, you know, exactly what we're talking about when we, when we talk about cloning a woolly mammoth. We're not talking mm -hmm. about Jurassic Park. We're not talking about somatic cell nuclear transfer like they do with Dolly the sheep. Right, there's, there's no, um, there's no, there are no intact cells in any of these abundant fossils. There's abundant DNA, and the woolly mammoth genome has been sequenced, but there's no way that you could clone a pure woolly, woolly mammoth, at least based on what everyone's been trying. So what's really happening is, um, 
people are trying to make mammothy elephants. So they're taking an elephant and they're using CRISPR technology to insert uh, particular genes into the elephant genome that we know are coded for mammothy traits like thick fur, red fur, um, uh, a hemoglobin that is kind of like an antifreeze in the blood, um, small ears, things like that. So they're basically ways of making a transgenic elephant that's cold adapted to the Arctic. So it's a mammothy elephant. And so then the argument becomes, well, okay, if we have a mammothy elephant, are we opening up a bunch of new habitat that we can then, you know, give to the elephants where they might be safe from poaching or um, you know, other, other conservation concerns. And so we might actually be able to potentially save the elephant as, uh, as sort of a, um, an evolutionary lineage. Um, and so, because the elephants used to be much more diverse. We used to have many, many more species in the proboscidean line. And so that kind of changed uh, a lot of my thinking as well, which isn't to say that we shouldn't have these important ethical discussions. Sure. Um, but I do think that uh, increasingly climate change is causing us to be creative. It's causing us to think outside the box. And um, these kinds of big picture ideas might be the way to go. It sounds like um, there are some people that when they hear about, and I want to go to audience questions in just one minute, but I want to ask you very quickly. Um, some people hear about uh, the conservation issues that we're facing and about uh, the things we've been doing apparently since the Ice Age to make Earth's surface an unfriendly Earth place for animals. And they think, actually, we ought, to, we ought to reduce our impact on nature. We ought not to intervene so much. Um, and it sounds like you're saying we ought to sort of embrace this Anthropocene situation we find ourselves in. Anthropocene meaning this being the age of humans, this being uh, the age when what happens on the surface of the Earth is going to be largely dictated by the actions and decisions of people. And that, I mean, if, if we are talking about bringing back the woolly mammoth, for instance, to save off climate change, it sounds like we're going all in, like we're not looking back. Well, I mean, if you want, I, to be clear, if you, we can be hands off. If you want to reserve, you know, 75% of the earth in connected, you know, reserves that span multiple biomes and let kind of let species do their thing in the wilderness, mm -hmm. you can definitely do that. And, and we might, you know, have some natural extinction, species will move around, they'll follow their, you know, they'll follow their optimal climates, um, they'll in, there'll be novel interactions, but we know that that's, those are all things that have happened in the past, so that, that doesn't worry me. But unless we're willing to sort of take down a vast proportion of the infrastructure that supports that, you know, seven and a half billion people, we're going yeah. to have to be more hands-on. We're going to have to, um, look into the managed relocation of species. If they can't get to the climate they need to be at over there, then we're going to have to actually move them. And not just move them, but actively <clears throat> manage them until they can establish a population. Um, we're going to have to look into, you know, uh, cloning and other genetic techniques to preserve not just species, but genetic diversity. Um, so I think we're going to have to be a lot more hands-on, or we're going to have to let go of a lot either of you know, the, the natural biodiversity that we value or um, our own uh, sort of quality or standard of living. Cool, okay. I wanna, Let me um, just jump in for yeah, a second. Yeah. We probably should have said this at the beginning, and probably everybody knows this, but when we're talking about climate change and what to do about it, the first place you go is get off fossil fuels no, it's as quickly mammoths. as possible. <laughs> right. The second thing, and at the same time, is stop chopping down trees. Preserve the tropical forest. Right now, we're putting around 10 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere each year. That's coming from burning fossil fuels and secondarily from <coughs> chopping down tropical forests. That's, we should start on those things. We can do it. It's with, under our power. It's not easy, but we can do it. The permafrost issue is not directly under our control for the most part. You, sure. If you want to keep the ground cr frozen, stop chopping down trees, mm -hmm. get off fossil fuels. But this idea of um, restoring the grassland, mm -hmm. if we went that route, it may buy us some time. It may keep that ground colder, longer in the Arctic to buy us a little bit more time to control those things that we shouldn't be controlling now. Great, okay. I've got a few questions right here. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, if if um, um, ice ages caused mass extinctions that were then followed by propagation of new, you know, uh, you know, plants and, and new animals um, and everything else, um, have you been able to study how that's differed from ice age to ice age? Does it, does it come back in 
you know, how, how different is it when it comes back? Oh, that's a really good question. So there's been a lot of a debate about a how widespread extinctions were in response to the climate wiggles of the, of the last two and a half million years, sort of this warm period, ice age, warm period, ice age, and they've gotten stronger in amplitude as we approach the present, so the ice ages have been more severe. Um, so I've actually got a paper I'm about to submit that, sh that suggests that climate change or climate driven extinctions were much more prevalent than we thought um, in the last two and a half million years and that we need to do we need to get a better handle on the sort of casualty list of the ice ages um, because I think we can learn from those going forward um, in terms of but th those, those environmental changes also drive speciation, right? So when you have novel or new environments, you tend to get new species. And that can happen quite rapidly, in fact, even within the last few centuries of human land use. Uh, for example, there's some really great examples of you know, new, uh, of, of rapid evolution in fishes that were um, isolated by, by colonial dams in New England, right? And so we know that there can be quite a lot, a, quite a rapid response of species to climate change. So there's even in terms of contemporary climate change, there's some question about whether or not evolutionary rescue will save some of these species, whether there'll be rapid adaptation to some of the changes. Probably not for most things, but for some species maybe. Um, and certainly some species seem to be more resilient than others. Plants seem to do really well. They have all kinds of creative strategies for getting through tough times. Um, and, uh, and so we know, you know plants might do better than say amphibians or um, some birds or um, you know, large herbivores and large carnivores seem to be especially sensitive. And so um, yeah, to, to, by studying the, the past you know, two and a half million years of climate changes, both in terms of extinction and diversification when new species show up. Um, that's, that's sort of the, that's like the cutting edge right now. As we've improved our ability to date uh, events in the past and align those with better high resolution climate records, we're now just starting to really get a handle on, um, you know, when things go extinct, what, what's happening with the climate system when those things go extinct, and what the mechanisms were. Because you know, we have lots of patterns, but we need to understand the mechanism a bit better. Uh, yes, in the back, and then we'll go right here. Uh, Dan Perlman. Uh, this is a very interesting conversation, but I don't really feel that we should try to um, resurrect the woolly mammoth uh, or uh, um, species like this. Uh, I feel like we should work on things that we see right in front of us. For example, 100 years ago, there were 20 to 25 million elephants on the, in Africa, and now there's only 400,000. There's been great uh, numbers of uh, rhinoceros in the past, and now there's only a few thousand left. In my lifetime, the human population's gone from 2.5 up to 7.5 billion according to what I have on my iPhone today. So um, why don't we work on keeping the species that we've got here instead of trying to put new ones that were here 12,000 years ago? I agree with all those points, uh, but I don't think of it as an either or. I think, I mean, we certainly need to do everything we can to protect and preserve what we have. Um, there are going to be some scientists working on these other issues, thinking about bringing back some of the, those that have gone extinct. And I, I don't think that takes any of the incentive away from preserving what we have remaining. I would also add that um, all of that work on cloning the woolly mammoth, you know, much of it's happening in George Church's lab at Harvard, it's mm -hmm. all privately funded. It's not coming from you know, the National Science Foundation or other sort of taxpayer funded um, initiatives. And so a lot of the people who are funding that work, it's not, for, for those people, it's not a matter of mammoths or elephants, it's mammoths or Mars, right? They want the next big idea. They want the moon landing for biology. They want, you know, they, they, they're thinking way up here. Um, and there are serious problems with that way of thinking, right? We can't treat our planet as though it's disposable um, and we can just, you know, go colonize another one or that we can just resurrect any species and fix any mistake we make. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to make it really clear that um, I also agree we should be able to do both, you know, if, this, if these kinds of initiatives can also help contribute to a better understanding or protection for elephants, that's where the impetus of a lot of my research <coughs> comes out of, but also that um, just in terms, of, uh, in terms of even, you know, where the funding is coming from, it's not necessarily an either or. The, the part of it I worry more about is you could think of this idea in the 
under the umbrella of geoengineering that is intentionally modifying Earth's climate. And there's a lot of debate about whether we should think about geoengineering. And I think the most compelling argument for don't even go there at all, don't even do the research to see if it's a possibility to do this, is that if we think we have some tool that can save us in the end, it takes some of the pressure off for doing what we know we should do right now, that is weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels, preserving mm -hmm. forests. And I think that's a valid argument. Mm -hmm. um, personally, if we want to talk a little bit about this, I, I think it's worth, and I think more and more uh, people are starting to think it's worth actually doing some of the research to see if there are reasonable ways to control Earth's climate if it gets to the point where we absolutely need to do it. If things get bad enough that we need to pull that tool out, it'd, it'd be nice to know if we have a tool that can actually do it and what the negative consequences might be. Max, Jacqueline, uh, we are out of time, but thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you.